All right, I'm glad to be here. So I, I'm a plant pathologist with the University of Minnesota based in St. Paul. I primarily work on soybean and corn diseases. And this is gonna to be totally focused on soybeans. So we're switching from small grains here to soybeans. I also work on corn. And corn, of course, has an issue that's, that the building in the southeastern part of the state is tar spot, which is something we're paying a lot of attention to and working on. But I wanna talk about that today. We're gonna to totally focus on these two soybean diseases that have been, well, either here for a long time or um, spreading and increasing across the region. So these are so caused by soil-borne fungal pathogens. They live in the soil, they survive there for a long time. Once they're there, it's very hard to ever get rid of them. That's a key point. And we'll start with sudden death syndrome. Now, this name, this disease, um, it's called sudden death syndrome, but I think it's really a terrible name for the disease. It was, the name was attached to it back in 1970s when the disease was first found in Arkansas. And it really doesn't kill suddenly. It really starts attacking the plants in the spring. Probably infects within two to three weeks after that seed germinates in nice moist soil in the spring. The plant, it gets in there and then it kind of grows throughout the root throughout the summer and really doesn't cause a lot of damage typically until we get into August. Now I'll say, I bet many of you have not seen this yet, and I hope that stays true for a long time, but I'm gonna show you where we know it to be, and I'm gonna, I, if I were a betting guy, I would bet it's a lot more places than I'm gonna show you on that map. And the key, real key point here is even though we see the most brilliant symptoms on the leaves, the pathogen is not there. The pathogen is in the roots, it's a root rotting pathogen and as it's growing in the roots, rotting the roots, it produces a toxin that moves up through the plant into the leaves and destroys the leaves. So this is why a foliar fungicide has no benefit for this. Okay, um, so again, it's a soil-borne fusarium fungus. You hear a lot about fusarium fungi in lots of different crops. This is a really bad group of organisms. Um, yield loss can be very high. Yeah, I wrote over 50%. Occasionally we see it at that level over large fields, even southern Minnesota and Iowa, but usually it's not at that level. For one main reason, it's a soil-borne problem and it's patchy in the fields. We usually don't see severe disease, SDS, over large fields. Although again, like I say, it does happen. Um, the losses depend on when the plants are infected and the extent of the problem in the field, the weather and the soybean variety. I'll talk more about soybean varieties in a few minutes, but you know, in the southern part of Minnesota, across Iowa, Illinois, et cetera, you know, they've been breeding for SDS resistance for decades. But they've had the problem for decades. Up here, of course, it's, it's becoming a newer problem. There's a lot less effort put into breeding, and hence there's less resistance available in soybean varieties. But there is some now, so that's becoming an increasingly available option. So again, it occurs in patches in the field. You can see this field here. This is from near Mankato, Minnesota. But you can see kind of the edge of the, the hotter spot, the yellowish areas where SDS is. If we were to walk out into that field beyond that area where you can see the edge of the yellowish to the darker green, it definitely changes. Cut. There's, there's, there's SDS out there too. And over time, this spread over more of the field. So what can this do to the yield, and why do we care? And here's just an example. I put a susceptible variety in a field that had no SDS in the field, except in the plots where I put it. So that same variety in the plots with and without the disease, there was a 20 bushel yield difference. And that's not 50%, no, but this wasn't also the highest level of SDS. But giving, here's an actual measure of what we could see. That is not uncommon, I think, in a lot of places when we have the right conditions for the disease. So again, a key point here. You know, we're on the edge here, where we are now. SDS is spreading. You kind of look at that map. It's been moving from the south to the north. It was first found in southeastern Minnesota in 2002. And you can see it's been found in North Dakota in two counties. I'll show you where those are in a minute, but it was found here first in 2018 in North Dakota. So where is it in our region here? You can see the southern half of the Minnesota, there's in virtually every county. You might see a couple counties absent in the midst of others. It's just simple, we never got a sample from there that we confirmed, okay? 
um, say in the southwest, you can see those two counties in North Dakota, one just across the border from here. Um, one way up on the Canadian border. Now again, if I were to make a big bet, I would bet that it's somewhere in between there. It's not just in those two isolated locations. We simply just have to find it. So that's one thing I'm, I'm sending the invitation to, to try to increase maybe the efforts to look for SDS this summer, especially in August, to figure out where this is really spreading, where it has developed. Now, you may ask, why is that important? Well, a couple of reasons. One, we'll talk about management strategies, but if we, the management strategies are very directed toward SDS. If we don't have a problem with SDS, we don't want to either use them or pay the money to get them. Second thing is, you know, the breeding efforts, the companies, you know, they make their decisions to breed based on the problems that are prevailing in the area. As we all know, the soybean varieties that are bred for southern Minnesota, where SDS is a common problem, don't do well up here. We don't plant them here. There's been a lot less effort put into breeding for SDS resistance. So if we can document again where it is, not only would it help increase the research effort toward SDS resistance for our northern maturity soybeans, but it would help them do some of the field research as well, the seed companies. And you might see there's a couple counties not too far from here in Minnesota that have a big yellow question mark on them. We got samples from those, but we could never absolutely confirm for sure because the samples weren't in very good condition when we got them, whether it was SDS for sure, although we have a strong suspicion that it was. Okay, what are the risk factors? Number one, obviously, is the presence of the pathogen. It's spreading, it spreads in soil. Anything that moves soil would spread this. And there seems to be an uncanny association between this and soybean cyst nematode. And you're all familiar with how that's been spreading. We often see SDS develop some years after SCN is first found in the area. Um, compacted soil, poor drainage, high soybean cyst nematode populations, susceptible soybean varieties, all obvious risk factors, I think. Wet soil for two to three weeks after planting. So that key time after planting until you know, a month or so, that's when a lot of the infection seems to occur. We have dry soil conditions there. We have a lot less infection. We have less of a problem later in the season when we see the disease symptoms. Okay, what do we look for? Okay, we look in August. This is when we usually start to see it. Um, usually in periods in low, poorly drained, compacted areas first. And look for these yellow and brown patches between the veins. And it often occurs in patches. As I mentioned, here's another field. Here is an example of a field. We can see the light area. That's, that's more severe SDS. And that's not at the bottom. There's a slope there in that field. And this is on the side of the slope. Now here's a better example of what the symptoms look like, what you want to look for. And that is you can see, especially on the left, in this lower uh, trifoliate here, um, this leaflet, you can see the very early symptoms, these sort of chlorotic patches, these yellowish patches. You can see as we go around here, it's becoming more and more severe. I'm guessing there's different amounts of the toxin that have moved into these leaves. And you can see more advanced SDS here, where there's a lot more death of the tissue, and the leaves are cupping. <clears throat> now, in terms of diagnosing it and scouting for it, we have to keep in mind that other diseases can look very similar. The most common one of those is brown stem rot. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, but that's, that's very common in the area and throughout, especially as we go east and south, uh, not so much north. Root rot's caused by other fusariums, can cause very similar symptoms on the roots and others out there as well. So it's important to be sure what we're looking at. And looking at this SDS versus brown stem rot, you can see those leaflets, they look very, very similar. But if we split the stems, the brown stem rot is, is very clear how it's named. Um, it does cause that dark browning in the pith, although it may not always be as extensive as you see here. And let me back up here. Whereas if you split open the stem with SDS, it will have a white pith until the plant dies. Okay. And the other thing to keep in mind is that the SDS pathogen is not exclusively a pathogen of soybean. It also infects dry edible bean. 
and so it can cause severe root rot. Um, and it can look very much like the root rots that other Fusarium species cause that have been here a long time. So how do we manage this if we have to deal with it? Number one, again, know where it is. The more we know about where it is and what our risk level is, you know, the better we are off in managing it. Use resistant soybean varieties. Um, there's more and more being known about maturity groups growing in this area, but we're still more limited on that front than we are further south. Then there are seed treatments available. And that's relatively new. In the last seven or eight years, we have seed treatments, specific active ingredients that work well for this disease. We had nothing before that time that really worked well. Two fungicides that are most widely, widely marketed and generally considered the most effective would be Olivo, now from BASF, but used to be with Bayer, and then Seltra with Syngenta. And another product out there is Heads Up uh, from Plant, Plant Protectants Inc. up in Saskatchewan. And that is a biological product that helps enhance the plant's defenses against SDS, and it does provide some benefit. So as far as the resistance, if you can make this out, you can see two plots here side by side. This is a septal variety, this is a resistant one. And this may not be as clear as I, I'd like it to be, but this is pretty yellow, it's actually dropping leaves. This is dark green, fuller, not dropping any leaves. So the resistance, again, can make a big difference. That's the number one best thing we can do to manage SDS. And again, what's the difference between susceptible and resistant varieties? In this case, we put two side by side. Uh, there was an 11 bushel yield difference just based on the variety with the same, roughly the same level of SDS. So you might say, well, that isn't as high as, or the difference isn't as much as I showed you before, just what SDS can do. That's because even the most resistant soybean variety, no matter where we are, no matter how long the breeding effort has been, they're not fully resistant, they're only partially resistant. So still they can provide a lot of protection compared to no resistance at all. So seed treatments, now that's, that's the newer area that's really become uh, important and useful for SDS management. Here's an example of a study we did in Rosemont, Minnesota. On the left is there's no seed treatment, on the right there is, and there was, there was about a 15 bushel yield difference here. Um, again, the, the plot on the left is, is losing a bunch of leaves. It's becoming defoliated early. And so when uh, all these products then became available not too long ago, we looked at, did a set up a study over a few years to how, see how they compare and how effective they are for managing SDS. Because these are not cheap. Um, adding these active ingredients, especially the fungicides, can be $10 to $12 an acre just for that added ingredient on top of the other seed treatment package. Although I know that depends exactly what kind of a, uh, I guess a, a program is, is purchased, but it's in that price range, last I heard. So we looked at studies to compare these and see how well they actually worked. And this, you know, sometimes these pictures show up really clear and sometimes they don't, depends on, uh, on the projector. And this is not showing up real clear here. But what this drone photo of these plots show, so each of these rectangular plots is about 10 feet by 30 feet. We have all these different treatments out there. No seed treatment at all, an acceleron-based tr seed treatment, and then acceleron plus Elevo, plus Heads Up, or plus Saltro. And if we can make it out here, maybe a little bit, and here, there's some darker green plots that have much lower levels of SDS, and those are the ones that have Elevo and Saltro. We saw some effect from Heads Up, but it wasn't as distinct as the others. If we actually look at the data, it just makes it much more clear. Um, this is a year we had a good level of SDS in the study, so I'm going back to 2020. The red and the blue bars are two different soybean varieties with different levels of susceptibility to SDS. And here are the treatments. None, that's just bare seed. Base is just an acceleron, kind of, kind of a standard mixture. Base plus heads up, base plus olivo, base plus saltro. What these bars show is the higher the bars are, the more SDS there was. The lower they are, the less SDS there was. So we can see on this end, you know, olivo and saltro 
dramatically reduce the amount of SDS. You know, that worked very nicely, and heads up also dropped it compared. If we look at how the yield looked, the highest yield, fortunately, was the one with the lowest SDS, which was of almost 75 bushels, whereas the no seed treatment at all was 63 bushels. So again, we're seeing a very nice benefit. But the big question is, how much benefit will we see if we don't have SDS? Now, some of you know that these products are also sold uh, as an added benefit against the soybean cyst nematode. There is some activity there, although it's not as effective against nematodes as it is against SDS. But unfortunately, these seem to have a pretty narrow range of activity, primarily against SDS, not so much against other root diseases, at least so far. So that's as much as I want to say about SDS, just to give you that summary. Any questions about that before I move into the next disease? Okay, we'll have time for more questions at the end if there are any. So the other one I want to talk about briefly is rhizoctonia. Now there's nothing new about rhizoctonia. I think all of you are quite familiar with that. It's another fungal pathogen that lives in the soil. It doesn't just attack soybeans. It attacks dry edible beans. It attacks sugar beets. It attacks corn. The same pathogen can go across all those crops. And so this is, there's nothing new about it, but it can be a major, major issue. And uh, the pathogen is called Rhizoctonia solani. Again, it lives in the soil. It can survive there for a long time in the absence of soybean. It affects the seed, hypocotyls, and the roots primarily in the lower stem. Um, common types that infect soybean can also infect sugar beet and vice versa, for example. It's favored by moist and warm soil. Plants often die in groups. Um, the red-brown color you can see here is a diagnostic feature. And I'll show you better pictures in a minute. But it kills plants primarily at the vegetative stages. Once plants get very big, they're much more resistant to this. So most of the damage occurs in young plants. And if they survive it through there, oftentimes they do just fine, although sometimes they're still stunted after that point. So here, symptoms. You know, it can attack the seeds right in the ground. It can cause this post-emergence damping off, causes hypocotyl rot, and causes root rot. You know, the challenge with these symptoms at this early stage is if you don't catch it at just the right time, those plants kind of melt and rot really quickly into the ground. So that's a hard stage to diagnose. Something happened there. Excuse me. Okay. Anyway, um, I don't know why that happened. Anyway, here are symptoms here. Again, we often see these scattered plants initially which is always a mystery to me, because we can inoculate a field with high levels of rhizoctonia in the rows, and yet we only see a fraction of the plants dying. It's all the same variety. Um, anybody have a good explanation for that? I'd, I'd like to know what it is, but it's not, not, not that unusual. I've seen it in lots of commercial fields. But this picture right here is the one that's really classical for rhizoctonia, this sort of red brick color on that lower stem or root although we don't always see it as distinctly as it is here. And you can see that to a lesser degree here, and then these, these reddish-brown spots here on the side of the stem. So the factors that increase it, again, moderately wet soil, not saturated soil, not like Phytophthora, which likes saturated soil. This one is moderately moist. Warm soil greater than 75 degrees. Late planting dates. So. You know, you, you all know how this adds up. We often see some of the more severe rhizoctonia when we have planting delayed due to rain in May. By then, the soil's warming up. It's moist. We plant when we can. It's ideal for this disease. And I'll show you what it can do under those conditions. Nutrient deficiencies can help it along. Physical damage and stress to soybeans. And herbicides actually can can make a difference as well in residue. How can we manage this? 
you know, we can use good economic practices, do the things that we always try to do anyway as best we can. Seed treatments are actually quite effective. We've also looked at what's the potential for resistance, and that's how I'll, I'll end here today, talking about those two things. Common fungicides, there's a whole host of fungicides used. Uh, uh, two or three different active ingredient classes. Many of the same ones are used for sugar beet. Um, and if you want to know what has worked best for this disease, there's a website called the Crop Protection Network. And there's a table there that shows efficacy of different seed treatments against different soybean diseases. And it's updated every year, and it's a very useful kind of general reference. And that's shown here. For example, in this table, the blocked out section in red shows the relative efficacy of these different seed treatments, which I know you can't read in the back of the room, but against Rhizoctonia in that case. And this is against Pythium, Pythophthora, and some other diseases. So a very useful reference, I think. Okay, I did some studies a few years ago down in Wasika, and what you can see here is how well the seed treatments again can work. Here are two plots side by side, each four rows, with a seed treatment, without a seed treatment. You can see we lost most of the plants there. And it's similar here, seed treatment, no seed treatment. Now, and one thing I want to say here, I've been mentioning seed treatments a couple times, is that if we really want to manage these diseases, we have to be selective about which seed treatments we use. Right? Very specific active ingredients really are targeting Rhizoctonia or SDS. If we just get a standard package, it may or may not have the ingredients that we need to manage these diseases. And again, we did some studies to look at sensitivity of Rhizoctonia against these fungicides. So this was done in conjunction with Ashok Chanda up in Crookston and Prativa Sharma. She was a graduate student. And we asked the question, is there any developing resistance to the commonly used fungicides? I think we're all aware that fungicide resistance is a big concern and has been reported in Rhizoctonia in different parts of the country, although not here. So we did some studies looking at this in Rhizoctonia from this region. And essentially what we found is there's no signs of any resistance in that population of Rhizoctonia that we sampled. So that's a very good sign. Um, we're not seeing any selection for resistance. Although, of course, the longer we use these products and the more we use them in crops and rotation, the bigger the risk is, right? But the good thing is we don't see any sign of that. So these products are promising to be effective for, for some time. The other thing I want to mention is what about using resistant cultivars? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, we don't have anything. I'm not aware of any soybean variety that's sold that has, that's labeled with resistance. And I think I'll, I'll show you why that's probably the case. And, and we did some studies trying to figure this out. So I had this idea that I wonder if there, are, there is resistance. Well, we saw some interesting results in our field study. So I just randomly picked from the seed bags that I had in my seed supply five different cultivars, put them out in fields with Rhizoctonia, or without Rhizoctonia, and looked at what, what is the stand loss. So this is, the, the higher the bars, the more stand loss there was, the fewer the plants that survived. Okay, we saw some that lost relatively few compared to the others. I thought, well, there's some promising results here. Okay, so then we expanded this study, and we did it on a much larger group of, of soybean breeding lines and we did it in Crookston, and we did it down in Waseca, Minnesota. And we wanted to see if we could see different levels of susceptibility or resistance to Rhizoctonia in soybean. And again, we, we looked at this in Crookston, 20 lines. Uh, in Waseca, you know, 24 to 33 lines in different years. And this, this is a good summary of the results right here. These are two plots with the same variety side by side, one with Rhizoctonia on the left, inoculated, one without Rhizoctonia right here. You can see what happened. We had very few plants survive. 
We had ideal conditions for rhizoctonia in that field. It was late planted because of rain, it was moist, it was warm. And how much did we actually lose? We lost over 90% of the plants in every single plot that we inoculated. We saw no evidence of resistance there whatsoever. Um, and we saw some differences, but none that really we would say hey, that that's something we should try to breed with or look forward to. Um, and this shows the, the loss in yield when we measured those plots. We're seeing 80 plus percent down to like 60% loss in yield because we're losing all those plants. And what about Wasika? We did these studies again over three years there, and we saw some varieties that lost over 80%, although we saw some that lost less. So again, there's some promise there, I think, but the challenge with working with this is such that we don't have a lot of resistance I think that the breeders can work with and try to move forward. But yet, there is some promising result there, I think. And so again, uh, there are some significant differences between those, those varieties and genotypes, but, but not really that consistent to say that's really exciting. You know, we saw some of them that looked just like this, inoculated versus the control. Again, we sometimes we lost most of the plants. Not terribly encouraging after all that work, I can tell you. Um, so what do we find here? Um, we found that, I didn't talk about this, but a lot of the isolates that infect sugar beets also infect soybeans, unfortunately. And rhizoctonia, as we know, is very responsive to environment. Again, those warm, moist soil conditions. Um, we saw some resistance, potentially, or less susceptibility, but nothing that's truly exciting at this point. So to summarize my last slide, again, SDS, sudden death syndrome, caused by Fusarium soilborne fungus is definitely spreading. It's moving from southeast Minnesota up to the northwest. As I pointed out, it's in at least two counties in North Dakota. Please, I encourage you to really make a diligent effort to look for this, you know, this summer, especially in August. Um, resistant varieties and soybean seed treatments work quite well. And rhizoctonia, I just summarized that, but seed treatments are probably still one of the better options for that. So with that, I'll say thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to ask, answer any if we have a few minutes. Gene? Yes? Have you tried to do it in an in furrow application? Yeah. Or what? yeah, that's a very good question. No, we haven't. You know, that's obviously, that's being used for sugar beets, right? You never know when you go into the season if it's going to be wet or dry. No, or you don't. Them, so. We have not. Um, that's something that would be a good idea to try. I even though that practice isn't widely used in soybeans, but it might be useful in some cases. Well, yeah. Sugar yeah, that's right. Yeah, question back there. Yeah, none of those had trichoderma in them. Yeah, yeah, there are some out there that are sold with that as part of the active ingredient package. None of the things that we included um, had that. But, but that's out there. That, that might be useful at some places. You're right. Yeah, some of these biologicals uh, are, are being used more and more, like trichoderma. It's a fungus, for those of you that don't know. Yeah. Any more questions? Both on SDS and Lysoctonia. All right, thank you. I guess we covered it all. Thank you.